Good morning, Mount Vernon Baptist Church. Good morning to all who have gathered to worship our God, our great God, our Savior Jesus. We are so happy to be here together today. Whether you're joined with us right here in this room or whether you're joined with us on the internet or TV, wherever you are, we are glad to be together. We are glad to lift up the name of Jesus. Come, Christians, let's join and let's sing together. Stand if you're able. Let's sing. Stand 
good to be together today. Thank you for being here to worship and glorify the Lord. It's been a great month as we've uh, taken this month to just be encouragement through Psalms 91. We praise the Lord for each of our staff members sharing. And this week we have the privilege of hearing Brother Kevin as he finishes up this book. And I hope that chapter is a blessing to you. Daniel has, uh, has got uh, part of the song coming a little bit later, and you're going to greatly enjoy that. We appreciate David sharing last week and how each week we've heard from different staff people. And, you know, we each are very different, unique, uh, but God uses that. And I hope you enjoy the uniqueness of how God works through each one of us. Uh, last week, we had the privilege of preaching at Mount Moriah. We send greetings to you from that church Mel Winstead was one of our boys here years ago, and he and his wife Heather are doing just a fabulous job there in that church. It's uh, Mount Moriah. You say, where is that? That's at Marshville. Tell you the truth, I didn't even go to Marshville. I don't know where Marshville is. Um, we left, we put our RV at Lake Tilly, and uh, we drove an hour to the church, and the church is not in Lake Tilly in Marshville. It's in the country. And so we drove for an hour, no service stations, no restaurants, nothing but woods for an hour in North Carolina. It is absolutely amazing. We saw wild turkeys, we saw deer, and then the farmland started getting very plentiful, blessed, you could say. And then you come to a hill, and on the top of that hill is Mount Moriah. And you stand out in the front door and you see South Carolina and the hills and valleys, that area. And then you look on the other side and you see North Carolina with the hills and valleys. And that church is uniquely located right on top of the hill. It was their 201st anniversary. Yes, they've been around 200 and some years. And <laughs> uh, there's nothing out there but farms. Uh, the church was, uh, we met in the, in the gym the building itself has not been used for a year or so uh, because it's so small. But their gym is big enough so people can spread out. So they have Sunday school, everything there in the gym. Uh, had a singing in the afternoon. And uh, he sends his regards to you. But he is doing a marvelous job. Been there about 15 years. And God is using him in a great, great way. Uh, the church is made of all kinds. Young folks, children run around all, everywhere. Say, so where did children come from? Well, they're the, the grandchildren of the parents. And so the parents keep their children there in the church, and children have children. And so uh, it's, it's a fun place, and we praise the Lord for it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to go off there. Um, today, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, there's, there's a number of requests among us. Um, we need to pray for each other and what we're going through these days. Uh, that's why Psalms 91 has got a good word for, for us from God. Bad things happen. But when they're filtered through to God, they become blessings. Let's pray. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us, taking care of us, for your word that's such an encouragement to us. And Lord, we pray for your word today to speak to our heart. Lord, we pray for uh, Janice Fox as her mother was buried last week pray your hand upon that family as they're recovering Lord we thank you for Marlene Rose <laughs> uh, she always wore a hat here at church such a blessing her and Levi and Lord you took her home this week uh, we pray for the service on Thursday here at this place that uh, she'll be celebrated in a great way and you'll be exalted. Pray for Levi. Give him strength to be able to carry on through these days. Pray for Shirley, Lord, as uh, she's recovering at home. Pray for Brian, Lord, your hand upon him uh, as he endeavors in new areas. Lord, we pray for Sylvia, your hand upon her as they're uh, working on the cancer. Uh, Lord, uh, there's others that are dealing with cancer and that sort of thing. Uh, and Lord, one of our members may be deployed 
because of Katrina or the, <laughs> the next storm like Katrina hitting our coast. Uh, we pray for those folks in New Orleans and what they're going through. Lord, our heart breaks when we hear people holding up a piece of paper in Afghanistan saying, save me, save me. And Lord, we realize that some awful things are happening in that part of the country. We pray for our servicemen. We pray for the Christians there, for the people that are left there, for your hand upon them. Lord, that all men would say, save me, save me. You're the only hope we've got. And we turn to you. We commit our leader in our country now to you to direct their hearts. You're our only hope. And we love you and going to exalt you and praise you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand once again. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? And the peace divine is comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell, for I know. That is who you 
Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe. word tells us we sing that the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. I was 
servant to the king, interpreting his crazy dreams. I wouldn't worship mortal man, so they threw me in the lion's den. Vicious teeth are all I saw, but something came and shut their jaws. Couldn't find a scratch on me. In fact, that night I fell asleep. When morning came, I shot them all, cause my God fights for me. stuff, isn't it? Do you feel it? Man, it's supposed to be that way. When we approach the Word of God and the things of God, it should stir us. I don't want to start off crying, Pastor. You know, it's the worst, but man, I'm already, I'm already there. I'm already excited because of God and who He is and who He is to me and who He is for all of us here. So I just want to invite you this morning, if you're here with me, let's, let's stand together. Let's enjoy the reading of God's Word. We're actually going to sing God's Word this morning. Please stand with me, if you will. The young lion and the serpent you will tremble underfoot Because he holds fast to me in love I will deliver him I will protect him Because he knows my Trouble, I will rest. 
life I will satisfy Him Because He holds fast to me in love I will deliver Him I will protect Him Because He knows my name When He calls to me I will answer Him I will be with Him in trouble satisfy him and show him my salvation and show him my salvation amen you may be seated this morning i'm so glad you're here and I'm grateful to be up here this morning. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm more nervous than normal. I don't know what that's about, um, other than the fact that this means a lot. It's a sweet, sweet thing to be able to be a part of this and to be able to have a, a little part in the bringing to everybody that can hear us a little bit of hope, a lot of who God is, and how to have that comfort and peace that only God can provide. So a while back, Pastor was... Um, getting together with the staff and as he was praying and trying to determine needs of the body he was noticing and all of us were noticing the, the the discomfort in the world it seems like the world's just been coming apart at the seams all the troubles and trials and the things that nag at us and pull at us and and strain at even our own hearts they they get in the way of everyday life and before long our focus gets off of what's important and we find ourselves worrying about and, and studying on and thinking about all the things around us that that overwhelm us and from time to time, as people that love God, we need to be reminded that God is good and that He is our shelter. He is the one we can come to for comfort and peace and protection. I mean, for the last almost two years now, we've been inundated with a worldwide pandemic, and you can't turn in any direction without thinking about that. And for some, it even gets in our minds that somehow catching the virus is a death sentence. For others, we, we worry about the day-to-day -day things in life, the economy, or, or, or in the larger sense, what's happening in Afghanistan and other places in the world. And, and looking at the pictures of those, those young service people that died, I thought, man, they look like kids. And it hurt my heart to see them. Sometimes it gets overwhelming to look at those things. In a more personal sense, I think of the young people in this room who are worried about getting good grades or maybe passing their grade or getting a driver's license or will they find a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Will people accept them? Will they be liked? Some of them wonder, what's the purpose in life? Why am I even here? It doesn't, it doesn't feel like they have any purpose and, and they're drifting through life hurt and lonely and sad. For adults in the room, we're worried about <laughs> getting a job and keeping a job. We worry about our relationships. We've seen marriages crumble and break all around us, and in society, it's, it's overwhelming. And before long, every storm and everything, every shadow that goes by us is just overwhelming. It's heavy for us. I don't know about you, but every now and then, I even begin to feel guilty for feeling bad and worrying. You know, you just get overwhelmed with that. Like, how is it that I, a person that, first of all, I'm an adult, right? And, uh, when I was a kid, I was a, a I just thought adults could take care of anything and everything. Secondly, I'm a believer. I've given my heart and life to Jesus. I, I come to church. I try to be a good person, and I try to do, do good things. But yet it seems like the, the fabric of the world is being pulled at all around me and being torn. There's perverse things in this world. It, 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 it's, it's, I can't even wrap my mind around it, and it overwhelms me. And then I begin to feel guilty about even that as someone who loves God. So here's the question. Where does a troubled soul Go to find peace and refuge. Help. I want to turn your direction to Psalm 91, verse 1. It says this. He who dwells in the house or the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, I don't think you can take Psalm 91 and pick any one verse and say, oh, this is the key verse to all of this psalm. But if there was a vote going on, I would vote for this verse. When I read this verse, I don't just see the verse. I see God. Looking out across all of humanity and all of the problems, and he reaches out his hand. Come to me. Come to safety. 
Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we need in this world? I'm always amazed at the people that seem to have all of their life put together and things seem to be going good for them. But, but if you really knew them, if you really talked to them, you'd find out they're overwhelmed. Back in Psalm 90, just one psalm back, kind of talking about this question of life, it says this in Psalm 90, beginning verse 9. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. (sighs) The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Isn't that amazing? We read those words and, and you feel the weight of those words and the heaviness of them. Last week, uh, Brother David, when he was um, speaking, was kind and gracious enough to remind us all that Psalm 91 is from the genre of um, poetic writings. It's one of those things that, that in the Word of God, God's given us in a way that's approachable. Just like we, we had the verses in, in, in song, if you go to mvbcraleigh.com, that's Mount Vernon Baptist site, you can actually click on that song, the whole psalm, and sing it over and over and, it, and let it stick in your head and remind you of, of those words. But what's happening in the poetry of it all is, is the poet is trying to connect your, your rational mind and, and that part of you, that emotional part of you together in a way that helps you remember what you're hearing and seeing. So when you open up the poetry of the Word of God, God is saying, hey, I want to give you something that you can, you can, you can hang on to. You can, you can sing it or say it, but no matter what, it will, it will touch your emotions and it will mean something to you in a way that nothing else will. I want to give you an example of that. Think about this. A sweet or a good song sticks in your mind a whole lot better than the instructions of the most um, detailed manual of whatever new gadget you just bought. For all the guys in the room, the majority of us in this room, when we buy a new gadget, we just throw the instructions away anyway, right? Don't we, guys? Because what's the point in it? I'm not going to remember any of that stuff. I'm, half of it's written in another language. What's that going to mean? And, and God didn't want it to be like that for us. T- today, and this word is not meant to be like a technical training for you. It's meant to be drawing you into the emotion and the feeling of, of who God is and what he is in a way that you can hang on to it and have it. Many people in these days and times weren't educated. They'd not been to school. They didn't, they didn't work with outlines and things like that. So God needed to give them ways to hang on to it. So today we're blessed to be able to look at these later verses here. I want to kind of encourage you a little bit by saying this. Um, even though there's troubles in the world and even though there's problems out there, God gets to have the last word. Isn't that amazing? If you turn to Proverbs, you don't have to do that now. And you look, Proverbs 16 through 18 or about 98 verses of this. Man doing something and God responding to what man did. Sometimes man does something evil or wrong or bad, and there's a payment for that from God because man does something, but God has the last word in that thing. Sometimes man does something good and honorable and righteous, and God blesses and honors and, and gives him goodness because man did something, and God had the last word to what happened. There's 98 verses of those things. And you may say to yourself, well, why, why is that? How is that even possible that, that, that God gets the last word? Well, if you do have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. And in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it says this. He, talking about Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or anything. All things were created through him and for him. See, see God made everything. And I know that when I'm talking right now, I'm talking to two distinct groups. There's one set of people who are believers. We call them believers or Christians. And here's what those people are. Those are people that believe that God is real. Just as real as the floor they stand on, the air they breathe, and the life they move through. They believe he is real. They have no doubt. And because he's real and has sent his son to save us, they have submitted their hearts and lives to that gospel. There's no doubt in their hearts and their minds. that's, That's one group I'm speaking to. There's another group that there's doubts. They don't know. They don't believe necessarily. And even if they kind of believe, there's still doubts with them. Now, they may have an interest in the things of God. They may even read his word in hope, hopes that studying it somehow may, may give them insight or maybe coming to church or being around people that know God. Somehow that will give them a little insight. There's, but, but they're separate from the things of God. And the message of God, and then this is that, God created everything. He made it. And because he's the maker of everything, he gets to determine the use of that thing. 
He made it, he determines its use, and he determines its end. He has the last word. So for those of us that know him and love him, I'm glad God has the last word. But for those that don't know him on the outside, you need to understand that God has a last word to it all, and you need to grab a hold to him before it's too late. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In the book of Revelations, you don't have to turn there necessarily with me, but in Revelations, which is when we think of that book, we kind of think of the last word of God, right? In Revelation chapter 22, there's a scene where, where the writer John has, has been having visions, and God has allowed him to see what heaven's going to be like. He's been prophesying to him about a lot of the things that are going to happen in the end of it all, of all of God's creation. And in this scene in chapter 22, in the middle of it, there's this, this place where John sees an angel, and he falls down, and an angel says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Get up. I'm like you. <laughs> I'm nothing more than a servant like you are and your fellow brothers and your prophets and with those who keep the, listen to this, words of this book and worship God. Hey, I'm just one of you that worships God. I'm one of you that believes that God is real and that he is true and that what his word says is final and that he gets the last say so. And then the angel goes on to say in verse 10 this to John. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Hey, John, all these things you've seen, all these things you've heard about all the things in the world and all the things that are coming, don't hide them, don't lock them away, don't keep them from the world. Open it up, throw open the word of God so that the world can see it and know the truth of what's coming. It goes on to say, and this is the words of Jesus himself in beginning verse 12. It says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. See, Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is before everything. He has everything. He made everything. And he's coming one day because he's going to have to bring what's called a recompense. That's where we pay for the things that we've done. Just like back in Proverbs, the things that we've done good, there's a, there's a negative for that payment. There's a payment that we, we're due for the things that we've done in Christ. And in goodness, there's a payment in that. And it's coming due. It goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit... The creator, he gets the last word. And that's what's happening in Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a prophetic psalm. It is about Jesus Christ coming and what is going to happen to him on the cross. And that's what you've been hearing through the opening verses of this. But in the last verses, 14 through 16, it is God putting his final amen and his stamp on this scripture. God is getting the final word. And whenever he has the final word, you better be paying attention to what God has to say to each and every one of us in that time. So God opens it up for us, and, and as we've seen earlier in verse chapter 90, and by the way, chapter uh, 90 of Psalms was written by Moses, which makes it one of the oldest scriptures in all of the Bible. And yet when you read about the fact that in that scripture, God presents us as finite beings that are in a world filled with sin and toil and troubles, it's amazing how Psalm 91 just perfectly dovetails with that, and it says this, the infinite God says to the finite man, if you come to me, come into my shelter, come into my presence, and be my child, then you can enjoy the peace and the calm and the serenity of all things that God has for you. Examples of that here on earth, and one day, a future of that in heaven. So let's look together at this, uh, this psalm, the last part, beginning in verse 14. It, it's, it's, again, it's poetic, so it has a bit of a poetic flow. I was told when I was younger, try, uh, don't use conjunctions to start sentences. That's that's silly. I use them all the time because I don't, I don't, I'm not good at grammar anyway. So, but look what it says. If you're a person that marks in your Bible, in verse 14, underline, circle, or mark the, the word because. There's, it's there twice. And then underline and circle the words I, I will, where it says because, I will, I will, because. Do you get the poetic flow of that? I was at a, was at a um, memorial service <clears throat> yesterday, and it's amazing. Uh, in, in that old chapel we're in, they, they, they broke out some old hymns, and they were telling everybody where to turn, and Sandra and I were standing there, and didn't have to turn to any of those hymns. You know why? As soon as I heard the melody, I knew the words. I felt the words. It's just like this. God wants you to feel this scripture and take it into your heart in a way that, that when, you, when you're, you're um, overwhelmed in this world, you know what to do and what to reach to. The problem with us sometimes is our English translations have a hard time dealing with what the words were originally. But the Hebrew is so beautiful. Now, I'm not a scholar of any language, much less the one that I currently am speaking. But here's the deal. If you go and dig a little bit, the beauty of that language will come to you in a way that makes all of this come alive. 
Look what it says there in verse 14. It says, because he holds fast to me in love. Now, I've got some notes here that will keep me a little centered and, and hopefully keep us on time. And that word love is different than our word here in the American language. In, in, in the Hebrew, it is hesed. And really can also be translated um, into um, loyalty, commitment, right? It's, it's not like in America we think, or in, in our culture, a lot of times we think of love, we think of it being romantic or um, a sexual kind of love or a mushy, gushy, you know, puppy dog feeling when you fall in love kind of thing. That is not what this word is at all. As, as a matter of fact, the book of the Bible that is the most romantic of all the books, the Song of Solomon, this word is not even in that book. Because that's not what God is saying at all. But what he's saying is this, for, for, for those that hold fast to me in love and in devotion and in loyalty, he's going to do something for us. I, in, in my mind, that picture of clinging is sort of like if, if you've ever seen a flood, just raging, pouring torrent. In the middle of that flood, there's a rock. And the, and the and water's just pouring around and pouring around. If you could imagine on that rock a parent clinging with one hand to that rock, for all they're worth, and with the other hand, clinging to their child, knowing that if they let go of that child, that that child is doomed to a sudden death, maybe never to be seen again, clinging for all they're worth. That's the picture here. Because you're clinging to me in love, in loyalty, in faithfulness, and goodness, God says, I'm going to do something for you. And God reminds us of what that loyalty and that goodness and that faithfulness looks like. You don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says this. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God. See that loyalty and, and fidelity? The God who keeps his covenant and his steadfast love with those that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Love God that way. When you read the scripture, when you sing the scripture, see it that way. I'm clinging to God and I'm hanging on to him in, in that kind of love because God in turn loves me that same way, but in, in the most purest sense. We cling to God in love, but, and then he in turn clings to us in love. That's what he was doing at the beginning of, of this chapter anyway in, in Psalm 91. He's reaching out. He wants to hang on to us. It says, because we, you're, you're, you're holding fast to me, love, the, the Bible says that God himself will deliver us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word deliver, the first thing that runs through my mind lately is um, UPS, FedEx. And if it's USPS, them losing your package or something along the way. But that's, that's neither here nor there. We think of delivery as, as something going from a point A to point B kind of thing. That's not what we're seeing at all in this particular scripture. Um, for here, when we see the word delivery, we'll also... Um, kind of, or the word protect we get from that um, deliverance um, to, to be kept. If you think about it like this, if you lived in Israel back in their time, you would do something that Americans never do. You'd be worried about being overrun by your enemy, and you'd be worried about taking captive, or being dominated by someone else. We don't, we don't really think about that much here in America. But they're surrounded on all sides by people that don't really love them and always have been for all their generations. And so when they hear the, th the thought of God being a deliverer, they see him a little bit differently than that. And what they see is someone who would be taken captive away from where they belong, off into somewhere else and, and dropped there and left there. And, and, and there's a scene in scripture where, where when King David is out fighting a battle, he comes home to find that everything has been stolen. Another, another country has come in and just taken everything of his. And it says that he got his men and they went and they delivered everything back to themselves. He, he, it, it means you've got to kind of go and do. And if you cling to the Lord in love and hang on him for all your worth because he loves you, you know what he'll do? He will come to you and deliver you from your problems. Now let me, let me give it to you this way. You haven't necessarily been taken captive by another country, but you know what you have been taken captive by? Your worry, your sin, the troubles of this life, the things that overwhelm you and, and weigh you down. Have you ever thought about that? We get taken captive by those things. He Hebrews chapter 12 talks about being taken by our weight of our sin, right? It can, it can overwhelm us in a way that, that takes away our ability to do and to move and to go. And, and in a lot of ways, we find ourselves like, like, um, like the apostle Peter walking on the water. 
God's out in the, in, in, in the middle of the storm. They're on their boat, and they look, and they see Jesus walking on the water in this tumultuous storm. And, and all of a sudden, Peter looks out, and he recognizes that it's, that it's Jesus. And he sticks his hand out and says, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come to you. Let me come to you. And Jesus reaches his hand back out and says, come. Come into my shelter. Come into my safety. And he steps out on the water and he begins to go. And what happens all of a sudden is he becomes aware of the fact that he's in the middle of a tumultuous sea. And that that ocean, if he slips into it, he'll never be seen again. Or the things that are going on beyond his control. He's left the safety of this boat that he was in to step out into the middle of this thing. And he is overwhelmed. And he begins to sink according to scripture. And the Bible says that that Jesus rescues him. He, He delivers him. The things that are burdening you and weighing you down, God wants to deliver you from those things. He wants to to help you through those things. It goes on to say there that uh, I will protect him because he knows my name. So we have the first part of because I will. Now he has I will because. And and in the second part, he says, I will protect him because he knows my name. And and that word again, protect, um, is the word uh, shamar in, in the Hebrew. And it means this, to keep. Now, it doesn't mean to keep, like I keep a basket full of old shoes in our washroom at the house so that when I'm going out in the yard, I can put them on. Or in my shop, I keep jars with little screws and and nails and stuff in it that later on I can just maybe go dig through and find if I need it. But otherwise, they just kind of lay around. That's not what that means at all. This word in the Hebrew means this. It means to keep in a way to help something flourish and grow and be safe and be cultured and taken care of. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that if I cling to the Lord with my love and in my faith, that he in turn will cling to me and deliver me, and then he will turn around and protect me in a way that he will keep me in his presence, and not just keeping me and holding me as a prisoner, but keeping me in a way that helps me to flourish and to grow. One of the first times we see this word is when we see um, Adam in the garden in Genesis. He put him in the middle of that garden. He says, you keep this garden. You help it to flourish and grow. Let's do this together. The beauty of this message is sweet. I will keep him and help him to flourish and grow because he knows my name. Psalm chapter 9 verse 10 says this, And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Isn't it amazing? We see it over and over again that God's not going to forsake forsake those that he loves. He's not going to leave us stranded that if we know his name. And by the way, the only way you know the Lord's name is to know the Lord. So there's two groups I was mentioning earlier. The first group, people like myself that love the Lord, that believe he is real and have no doubts about that. When I hear and see this and think about that, I am am reminded that the moment I'm in an issue or trouble, I need to stop focusing on the things around me and turn back to the one that loves me the most. I need to cry out to him. And because he loves me in the same way, he will hear my cry. Acts chapter 2, verse 21 says this, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I don't know about you, but that's one of those sweet verses that in time, as as I've gone along and read, has been an encouragement to me. Before I came out here this morning, I just said, Lord, help me. Help me (laughs) to be able to share in a way that will make this seem real and true and and able to be um, held on to by others. If you cling to me in love, like you're clinging to that rock and clinging to your child with all that you're worth and for all you're worth, God will deliver you. He will come and save you and rescue you and bring you out of your troubles back to his safety and his shelter. He will protect you and help you to flourish and grow and keep you because you know his name. It goes on to say that um, when he calls to me, I will answer him. That's God's faithfulness and his fidelity. I, I want to um, just remind you that what, what he's talking about here is he's, he's hearing from us. He's going to um, care for us, and we'll call to him, and, and he's going to go on, and we'll, um, not only will he take care of us in our troubles, but he will rescue us, and he will bring us honor. Um, the word honor here points back to the word glory. And I don't know what it means to you, but, but to me when I think of this, I see Jesus Christ, the most humble of all the servants that's ever lived. 
the man who came and bore my sins to the cross and had every right to deny all of that and to let me go, and yet he did that. And because of his humility, God has elevated him with the most glory and the most honor. And because we love the Lord and we call on him and he rescues us, one thing when he places his glory and his honor on us, he, we shouldn't be seeking that for ourselves. We need to be seeking that in humility and letting the Lord do for us what only he can do. In John chapter 12, verse 6, it says, If anyone serves me, the Lord, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. As we serve the Lord and love him. I want to share one little passage of scripture, or a little, little bit of scripture from 1 uh, Kings. And in this scripture, I think we'll see a bit of all of Psalm uh, 91, 14 through 16 kind of revealed. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. And beginning with verse 5, it says this, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, What shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept him for this day. And you have kept him from great, with your great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on the throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in the place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted by multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding, mine to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? We see in this... The whole picture, God's steadfast love, David clinging to him in love and God responding with deliverance and care and placing him on the throne and giving him honor and glory and even allowing his children and his descendants beyond him to, to see that greatness. And then we see Solomon humbling himself before God in a way that says, God, you are God and I am nothing more than your servant. Help me to know how to live and how to be in this world that is filled with trouble and trial and evil. And God honors him. It goes on to say that with long life, I will satisfy him. Now, um, I'm getting older as time goes on. And what is what I realized that when I was younger, I had no concept of what blessings were until I got older. And the longer I live, even in a, a troubled world, the more I see God's goodness and his faith and his glory and his love demonstrated even in the midst of terrible things. If my heart is breaking and I'm worried about the health of a loved one, if I'm overwhelmed with my own inabilities or, or my own uh, lack of being able to do things in this world and it just seems to be so heavy for me, I'm reminded by the word of God and by his spirit that if I just call out to him that he will love me and rescue me and help me. And he's going to satisfy me with long life. Now, we think of that long life as living a lot of years on the earth. And, and maybe that's true. For some people, it is a blessing. And others, maybe not. But there's a bigger picture that God's trying to paint for us. And that is this. His ultimate long life is salvation. Is one day being taken out of this world of troubles into a place called heaven where he is forever and perpetually will be. Where there is no trouble and trials. Where there is no heaviness and problems. Psalm 91.1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. I just want to remind you that that shelter doesn't make the storm go away. You know what it does do? It provides protection in the storm. While you're living in this earth, according to the scriptures, there's going to be evil. In Revelation chapter 22, it says that the evil is going to continue. That, that, that all the terrible things are going to go on, but there's also going to be goodness and grace. And you know what God says? Let it be. Because God's going to have the final word. He's the one that's going to put his final stamp on it all. There's one, there is one Hebrew word that kind of has broken through and made it into the English language, and that word is amen. All right? For us, when we hear amen, we think, oh, well, the prayer is over. That means I can open my eyes and lift my head. For some people, it means that I'm agreeing in prayer. And honestly, that's, that's more of the context of the word amen is, Lord, I agree with you. This thing that I've just said to you and prayed to you, I'm agreeing that as much as my part is on that, I'm going to do that and perform that. 
When we say amen with somebody else has prayed, we're agreeing with them with their prayer. Uh, and that's, that's an important thing. But, but th- this is important to know also. The word amen is kind of like a, a, a cluster of words that have been put together that kind of make that word amen. And those words are kind of based in the, the word truth, trustworthiness, re- reliability, and faithfulness. Um, they, they use this word in a couple of places in Scripture where it mentions things like the ground that was so firm that you could, you could drive a, a tent stake into it and it would hold. You know, like, like it is firm and it is unmovable, amen. It is this thing that we can trust and hang on to. It, it also refers to water that is always there, that never runs out, like, like a constant stream. And for, and man, if you've ever been to uh, Israel in that area, it is arid and dry, and water sources sometimes can dry up and leave you in danger. And so the places where there's a constant spring or that kind of thing, it brings life and community and that kind of stuff. And that's what God is saying here in the end of this. He's saying amen to it all. I am the stable, faithful one. I am like the firm foundation that you stand on. I am the rivers of living water that never cease to flow. I get the last word in it all. Some of you are here today and, and, and you're saying, saying, Kevin, I appreciate that. I want to be able to read this in a way that I, I see these words and I feel the emotion of it and I can internalize it in a greater way so that when I am overwhelmed, my mind immediately stops looking at the trials and the troubles around me and I turn my face and my eyes back to the Word of God and to the God that loves me. Do you feel it? Like the songs we were singing this morning, do you feel it? Are you overwhelmed by it? We all should be. Behold, he holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. God, we know your name and we need to cry out to you. There's some of you here today who don't know his name. You just have a passing understanding of God. And here's what he wants you to know. I'm begging you. God is begging you. He has come to deliver you from all the troubles of this world and asking you to come into his shelter. Does that mean your troubles go away? No, it means that you'll be safe with him in the midst of those troubles. And that if you surrender and submit your heart and life to Jesus Christ, make him the Lord and the master and the king of your life, that one day at the end of it all, he's going to take you out of this troubled old world and take you into a place there will never be trouble again. That's his eternal salvation that he promises us. He said, in the meantime, I'm going to let you see it and experience and feel me here in ways that will delight your heart and bring joy to you and comfort to my people. But one day I'm going to take you out of all of that and bring you to my salvation and I'm going to show it to you. I'm begging you today. If you don't, if you don't know the Lord, don't, don't miss this opportunity. Some of us will be standing here in just a few moments while the music's playing. Get up out of your seat and walk down here. Let us share with you in Scripture so you can have that relationship with Jesus Christ that some of us already have. Let us, let us share with you. If you're here this today and you say, you know what, Kevin, I love Jesus. I have no doubt that he is God. But I have allowed the turmoil and the troubles of this world to get into my vision to distract me from the things that are most important. And I have been taken captive by my sin. I have been taken captive by my worries or my concerns, the things that are beyond my control around me. And they have pulled me away from God and away from my vision in Him. These altars are open this morning. You can come down here and get on these altars and speak to this God and say, God, let me come back into your shelter. God, come and deliver me. I'm reaching out and I'm, I want to cling on to you in love. And you know what He's going to do? He's going to in turn cling to you in love. And he's going to say, don't worry about those things in the past that are in the past. Enjoy the shade and the comfort of my day. It's been hot lately. I'm standing up here sweating now. I don't know how y'all feel. It's hot up here. You know what it's like to step into shade? You know what it's like to step into a place of peace and comfort? I want to kind of end with this. God God provides his, his deliverance. Sometimes we could call it his blessings. His blessings come in two kind of general ways. The first one is kind of in an immediate sense. He just comes and rescues us. I think about the children of Israel. God just came and rescued them. Ten plagues and and all the problems, and and they're out of there. But there's another way that God brings blessings and deliverance, and that's slow and steady and incremental. It's like cool, refreshing shade, conversations with good friends, the gentle cry of a baby, that food that we eat that satisfies us. In little ways, it's almost undiscernible and yet refreshing and pleasant and good. 
All the promises that God made to his son, Jesus Christ, in the prophetic words of Psalm 91 should be and are meant to be claimed by God's children. Every one of them. So then in the midst of the, the snare of Satan, which is real, and the pestilence and the plagues that are all around us that are real, the turmoil of war and, and all the things that are just horrible that, that evil can bring up and throw at each and every one of us, those things are real. In the middle of all that, God says, but I'm with you. I want to deliver you. I want you to be with me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that you've given us scripture, Lord, that is not just A, B, C's and outlines and one, two, threes, but is poetic and flowing and emotional, and we feel it, Lord, when we read it. Father, when I read the Psalms, I don't want to be reading them like I'm just trying to get in some words or a few sentences and go on. I want to feel them and the weight of them, and I want to be able to remember what they mean and why they're important. And it's amazing to me, Lord, how over and over and over again, the words and the things that point back to you point to your goodness. Lord, you are our strong tower. You are our deliverer. You are our help in trouble. You, Father, are the, the salvation of those that come to you. You, Father, are life. And all of those things, Father, remind us of your faithfulness and loyalty. Lord Jesus, if there's one person here today who has not settled that, but, but feels you, Lord, and wants to be your child, I pray that they would come this morning and submit their hearts and lives to you and begin their journey with you, Father, in your shelter. For those of us that are overwhelmed with our sin and troubles and the worries and the cares of this world, so much so, Lord, that we can't bear them anymore, I pray that we would just come to these altars and get down and say, Father, please, please take those things away and let me be rescued by you. Lord, only you can do those things because you alone are God. Thank you for your goodness, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastors will be down front as the music plays, and come on down. Let's stand. I just realized I had your microphone. <laughs> Miss Kim, welcome back. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand for our commissioning prayer. Uh, if you came prepared to worship through tithes and offerings today, don't forget we have the baskets at either of the back doors. You can also send that uh, check by mail to our post office box. You can also give online. 
And uh, thank you, Brother Kevin, for that word of encouragement from the scriptures today. Let's take that, that encouragement that God is with us, that he is our shelter and our refuge. And let's introduce somebody else to this great God who can be their shelter and refuge this week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for your word that uh, we've been able to gather and to hear it. We, we pray that by your spirit you will do a work in each of our hearts, that you will uh, encourage the faithful, that you will admonish those that, uh, that need to return, and, and that you will convict, uh, Lord, those who, who are unbelieving. That, that they would find refuge in you, that they would flourish as you intended for them to through life in your son Jesus and forgiveness of sin. So help us to take that message as we go. Help us to see the opportunities that are around us every day. Uh, we do pray that you will be with those in the path of the storm, literally uh, with Ida and then figuratively all the people that we know that we'll see this week that are they're in the path of the storm. Help us to point them to the only sure refuge, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen.